You are listening to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. I'm Kyle Bryant. And I'm Sean Bombsart. Together, we're navigating life with disability. All right. Welcome back to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. Thanks for tuning in today. Everyone deals with tough situations and challenging circumstances, although not all of the challenges in life revolve around health. It seems to be a common point of discussion on this show, especially considering the disease that Kyle and I live with. Um, before I get too deep, I want to just give our listeners fair warning that I've been fighting a bit of a head cold. So if I sound a little funny or if you hear a sniffle, please forgive me. Kyle, are you, you with are me today? Man. Are you here? Okay, thank yeah, you. I, I, at least you. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I was gonna let you just go on your own and let you <laughs> hang hang out there, you know. But yeah, um, yeah, well, I am I, here. I picked up on that. Thank you. All right. Well, let's keep going. Kyle and I, as most of our listeners know, we're, we're living totally different lives on the outside. Yet we both live with the same disease, Friedrich's ataxia. The condition looks different for each of us and looks even more different for others with the F- with FA or other people that we know, other people in the community. You've heard the saying before, uh, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. And today, we want to talk a bit about living with an invisible condition and finding ways to live beyond all the challenging circumstances that invisible conditions often present. Of course, we expect much of this discussion will apply similarly to many conditions, visible or invisible. Today, we've invited yet another special guest who's become an expert in this very topic. Alana Jacqueline has been a rare disease advocate for eight or nine years, publishes the award-winning Let's Feel Better blog. Alana is a health journalist, professional speaker, and she just published her first book. In fact, the title of her book has inspired this episode. Her book is called Surviving and Thriving with an Invisible Chronic Illness. As you can probably imagine, Alana is a patient herself, and she has spent the last decade writing, blogging, speaking, telling her stories from personal experiences. So we want to welcome Alana to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. Alana, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I've been, I, I've read a few posts on your blog over the years, and um you know, everything that you feature really reaches out to people and creates a community, and I, I love it personally, and I know a lot of other people do, too. Oh, I'm so glad. So, I'm going to jump around just a little bit. Alana, I know um, we want to talk about your book at some point, and I'm sure stuff will weave in and out, but since... We mentioned it just came out not too long ago. Tell us about that. Is that an exciting time for you? Um, what is what, what are you feeling? What are the emotions behind publishing that book? I'm really excited. It's kind of been a long time coming. Um, I, I started uh, writing the book after working on my, my blog, Let's Feel Better, for a couple of years. I started in 2012. And um, it, it kind of inspired the book, and that's how it came about. Um, but it's just, it's a long process publishing a book, and hmm. um, it's just exciting to finally be able to see it in print and know it's going to be in bookstores and available to people in people's hands. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty ecstatic. I saw your uh, Instagram post, your revealing of your, the I assume <laughs> was the first shipment of boxes to your house and it seemed like you and your puppy were pretty excited to be opening <laughs> this box <laughs> yeah it was a really cool day i had this uh i'd seen an advanced reviewer copy which is a little awesome. bit different than the actual 
book, um, you know, the back cover, like, has my face on it, and I was having nightmares about whether or not my name was going to be spelled correctly. <laughs> it was. I'm happier for it. It was all spelled correctly, so I can, I can take a breath now. That's certainly exciting. Well, in just a little bit, of course, we want to make sure our listeners know where to find it and how to get a hold of it. But before uh, we keep going, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where where did you grow up? Kind of where you're from? What is what is the story of Alana Jacqueline? Sure. It's kind of a long one. but um, yeah, We're, we're going to be here for a minute. Everybody <laughs> buckle up. No, I'm just like... <laughs> So um, I'm from South Florida. I live in Boca Raton, which is about an hour outside of Miami, and um, lived here all my life. I am a professional patient advocate, and uh, I wear a lot of hats. But um, yeah, this this book is my main project right now. I am a chronic illness patient. I have um, I have a couple of conditions, but uh, the one that makes me a rare disease patient is something called primary immune deficiency disease. And I'm also uh, a patient with dysautonomia. So um, my book and my story are, are kind of about, about living with those diseases and, um, you know, everything from, uh, you know, going to school and trying to build a career and dealing with like friendships and relationships and, and all of that with, you know, very active, ongoing symptoms for a real, you know, ongoing disease. Awesome. Well, thanks for talking about that. But I, I feel like there's some more to you. Um, you're currently married, right? Tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm married. I'm, I don't know if I'm, I'm 20 years old. I'm married uh, almost two years now. My husband, RJ, is a, um, a biochemist and um, he works for a pharmaceutical company down here and we have one uh, fur child happy who's our miniature poodle who is the love of our lives at the moment so <laughs> <laughs> I like that nice nice so do you guys go to the beach and I mean what do, what do you guys do for fun down there in Boca Raton um we actually both hate the beach, so it's it's, right. it's a really a wonder. <laughs> it's a wonder that we both live here. We're trying to we're we're thinking about switching locations because it's funny what we you know we both kind of grew up here, but I'm not sure it's quite the right setting for us. But with the constant hurricanes and the eighty degree weather, Florida's Florida's a uh, a unique place. Um, <laughs> but uh, for fun, I mean, we we both work a lot, so. I think for us, uh, a lot of our fun activities are just relaxing on the couch. We're very exciting people. Very nice. <laughs> I love relaxing on the couch. Yeah. You know, I was talking to a friend not too long ago, and I asked him, oh, what'd you do today? And he was like, oh, I just ran some chores and did some other nice things around the house. And I'm like, nice things? Like, what do you mean? He's like, I just relax and, like, pick stuff up and kind of straighten things out. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. And we both realize <laughs> that that as we get older, we appreciate those quieter days, quite, yeah. you know, like that a little more. Older. I, it's my biggest goal this weekend. <laughs> We're like, I'm going to do some laundry. I'm going to clean out our yeah. guest room closet. Like, this is going to be a good time. A good time. <laughs> How good uh, feel, uh, yeah. Get some party hats, everybody. <laughs> We're doing laundry. <laughs> nice. Well, Jackson, let's shift gears a little bit. You mentioned um, two of the conditions that you live with. So, can you? Break those down a little bit for us. What is it that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis regarding your health or maybe your symptoms? What are you up against? Sure. So, um, yeah, I can explain a little bit more about both of those since they're not very well known. Um, at 19, I was diagnosed with uh, PIDD, which is primary immune deficiency disease, which is a low immunoglobulin count basically means it's difficult for me to recover from infections or viruses and it's 
really easy for me to acquire them. So this flu season has been a shut-in season for me. Mm. So when I was 22, after that, I was diagnosed with dysautonomia, which is the dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, means that all the actions and reactions of my body that are automatic things, things like blood pressure, circulation, digestion, sleep, the ability to stay hydrated um, and keep up my blood volume, all of these things just kind of go haywire from time to time. And right now, there's really no overall treatment for dysautonomia. Each symptom has to be managed one by one, which is it's an ongoing battle for me, but... Um, I'm also working with a medical researcher right now because I developed some other symptoms with connective tissue issues like hypertrophic scarring and spontaneous abdominal adhesions and tissue growth that are outside of the diagnosis that I have. So, you know, like many rare disease patients, my story is still kind of ongoing. It definitely, it makes sense. And I'm, I like the way you word that because I think it's reality for most of us, if not all of us. It's that diagnosis doesn't, it is not an endpoint. That's just the beginning of a whole another set of roads and maps that you got to try to navigate through for the, usually the rest of your life. So, so right. How, kind of just like step one. So, Alana, what's your earliest memory of something that happened um, where you're like, all right, there's something wrong. I need to figure this out. Right. So, I mean, I was sick from day one. I don't remember a time where I had a healthy life to compare a sick life to. All I really remember is being undiagnosed to being diagnosed. And I think maybe the strongest memories for me are in high school and middle school and the kind of shock that we still live in a world where you can have the most obvious signs of a disease, things a person can't possibly fake and still be looked at like you're making things up. In, um, in my senior year of high school, I was really reaching the end of my rope with my immune system. This is going on 18 years at this point of almost nonstop infections, viruses, allergies, and no real treatment, no real treatment plan, just going to like a general pediatrician and hoping they'll give, you know, they'll give me a break by putting me on antibiotics that week. And, um, and at one point I had mono, I had Epstein-Barr and I remember just having a crazy sore throat and going to the pediatrician four days in a row to beg them to do some more tests, you know, telling them something wasn't right, you know, um, and getting straight up refused and and patted on the head and told, you know, it's just a virus and it would be fine and it'll go away on its own. Don't worry about it. And then I woke up, you know, on the, on the fifth morning of, of like my nonstop begging them to do something. And it's kind of gross, but I woke, I woke up that morning and I had just full on rush so bad. I could not open my mouth. And that's what happens with immune deficiency. That's just one of the, the symptoms that you get. You get to a point where your body just starts to break down and if intervention on like infections or viruses don't come quick enough, you end up in situations where, you know, suffering is inevitable. And that was just kind of like a very minor, I mean, later on, I realized how, how very much of a minor <laughs> issue that was compared to what I would later face. But, you know, sitting there in my pediatrician's office and, and finally getting a prescription to start mending things, it was just like, this is way too little, way too late. And it was preventable. Like, if someone had just heard me before, it wouldn't have gotten so bad. And that was really the point where I was like, I'm it. I'm the only person in my adult life who's going to advocate for me on this level. I have to speak up. I have to demand the best treatment urgently, or I'm going to have a real bad time. Mm. Yeah, well, I feel like it takes a lot of confidence to to look at a person in the face who's gone to medical school for who knows how long and be like, you know what, I know more about this than you, which is <laughs> obvious because it's you, right? I mean, it's your own body. You know what's going on in there. But to to look at somebody who, who's who got this stature or whatever and try to you know, make your point, I think is oftentimes an intimidating thing. 
it really is. It takes, I think, a, a long time. It's hard to do when you're like a teenager, especially when you're a kid and you're really not the one having those conversations. But I think it was like, yeah, and I, towards the, the very end of high school that I was like, whoa, this is it. Like, this is, you know, this is all me now. And now I've got to be the one to go in and state my case. And, um, and I talk a lot about that in the book about like kind of talking back to the doctor and, you know, realizing first that you are the number one authority on your disease. It may mm -hmm. seem like there are many, many great experts out there in the world, but you have lived in this body probably more often than your doctor has lived in a body with this disease in most cases. Um, and so, you know, there are some different tools you can use, but basically just starting to build that confidence that you are an authority and that your voice and your opinion on what happens in your treatment matters is, it's a subject that I, I touch on a lot throughout the book. And I, I love that train of thought. And I, I like that. Um, I got, you know, thank you. We got to read Alana's book a little bit early. Um, and she talks about this or brings it up at least in the early parts of the book. And I think it's a valid point across the board. You know, we hear, People and gurus talk about, oh, you got to respect your body in terms of rest. So you, only you can figure out when you need to rest and when you need to move. And, you know, when it comes to fitness, you know, be familiar with your body and be comfortable. And when it comes to your diet, know what works for you and what doesn't. And then all of a sudden, when it comes to our health, we all get so intimidated by somebody else's level of education that we just succumb to whatever they suggest. And I think the point you're making is, hey, maybe that's good and helpful, but it can't be the ultimate answer. Mm -hmm. Only you know what works for you, and only you know how their disease affects you. You've got to take that advice and that care with a bit of you know, maybe a grain of salt or as a side dish to what else, you know, because like, like you both have said already, um, that doctor may be really smart when it comes to the books, but he or she doesn't necessarily know how things play out in your particular life. So I really valued that section, that part of the book and, and this train of thought for sure. Yeah, I think it's, it's really a partnership and, I think especially in the case of rare diseases, I'm sure you guys have come across is that, you know, we only have so much information on any particular disease at this point, and we are all kind of guinea pigs to the ongoing research process of a disease. So, you know, you, you have to, yeah, take everything with a grain of salt because this is an ongoing learning process for everyone. So you mentioned that, you know, this thing, this throat thing that happened was, you know, small compared to what would, you know, happen in the future. What are some of those things that you can tell us? I I, I mean, I think that, you, you know, you, ex you put down some of them in the book um, and you don't have to go into every little detail if you don't want to, but you know, we wanted to kind of get a scope of what this means for your life. Well, I would say that, you know, when I talk about like the immune deficiency and, you know, ha having an infection that got so bad, it led to me getting like full fledged thrush and everything. That was, it, it was a minor thing to me. It seems like a minor thing to me now because I think the most recent, um, kind of major issue that I had was that um, I I have a port for dysautonomia, which is a central line. Um, it's accessed 24-7, which means it's kind of just like an open line in my chest. And uh, I need it for the dysautonomia because I do infusion several times a day and I do them at home. Um, otherwise, I would literally be in the hospital. My the whole, I would live in the hospital. There would just be no... Um, there would be no light for me. So I need to have it, but it is a conflict because with an immune deficiency disease, you're so susceptible to infections and just having an open mind is just, it's not a good idea. They don't recommend it, but because I have these two conflicting diseases, I just don't really have a choice if I really want to live a functional life. So that's a risk I take. Um, now in 2016, 
I started to get sick, sicker than my normal sick. And I got a fever for the first time in my life, which is, um, which is interesting with, with immune deficiency. A lot of patients don't get fevers because we don't fight back on infection. So we don't really know how sick we are until we're like in complete disaster mode. So at one point, um, I had an infection in my port and I really didn't understand how bad that could be and how out of control it could get if it wasn't taken care of correctly. And the diagnostic process of finding out that I had an infection, that it was in the port and the whole way that it was handled was such a catastrophe, mostly because I wasn't aware of, you know, how dangerous this was that I could go into sepsis, um, that, you know, I could just get a full blood infection. And, um, I ended up having to have my port removed and I was in and out of the emergency room getting blood tests for this and getting diagnosed with this, um, for about two weeks. And by the time that they realized they needed to take the port out and that it was becoming a life threatening situation, I was already very, very sick. And, um, I ended up having the port removed as an emergency procedure during Hurricane Matthew, meaning that I went into the hospital and instead of having a really qualified surgeon do the surgery and make sure that it was done correctly, I, <laughs> I went in and I had the least qualified surgeon there with the least amount of hospital staff and they ended up taking my port out without any kind of anesthesia and rip my port out. And then even though it was infected and we knew it was infected, Jeez. yeah, this is a real yeah. major awful situation. I, I blogged about it. Um, and <laughs> it was I feel really like I'm crazy. listening to a movie right now. Yeah, it was, it was really bad. I mean, just the, the whole way it played, it was just a series of very unfortunate events that started from my not having a great, knowledge about what was happening to literally having natural disasters play a part. This hurricane just, I mean, the hospital was empty. I had, um, none of my doctors were available. I was stuck with a surgeon who was fresh out of medical school who closed up. When you do a, a surgery on an infected area, particularly a port that is connected to a major, you know, artery vein, um, you're not supposed to close up an infected area. And she did. And when and I was so delirious from, you know, having surgery without anesthesia, um, I really didn't know any better. By the next day, they had to take me back in for emergency surgery and pull out like an ice cream sized scoop of tissue out of my chest. And I was in the hospital for a month of recovering. I almost went into complete sepsis. Um, it was just, just, you know, with an immune deficiency, you can go from zero to 60 so fast. It can be such a dangerous, dangerous situation. And I just, I didn't know how vulnerable I was and I didn't take the precautions. And, um, you know, it, when you, when you don't make everyone aware of the situation, when you're not on top of it, when you don't have other people involved who are going to be on top of it with you, when you're literally delirious, um, things can go south so fast and, that really played a part in the urgency for me to get this book out there because it was like, wow, you know, patients really don't know how vulnerable they are until it's almost too late. So, you know, given that story and you talk about a few minutes ago about being your strongest and your own advocate in the face of these situations, what were some of the steps that you took to begin your own little tool chest of fighting your disease despite not being a doctor yourself or being a nurse or, you know, just being the quote unquote patient, or I should say, quote unquote, just being the patient. Mm -hmm. What were some of the steps you took to, uh, to arm yourself? The first thing I did was realize that one, not everybody was going to know what my disease was, you know, the, the immune deficiency. And that is so, so critical when you're in emergency situations, which I often am um, regularly. So um, the first thing I really need to do was document what my disease was and translate it in a way that could be read and interpreted quickly to people who were not rare disease specialists. 
So I went ahead and made myself a binder, two binders. One was an emergency binder that had basic procedure for handling a patient with immune uh, immune deficiencies. So that was, I mean, it sounds like really simple stuff, but but you know, you can have situations where nurses and doctors don't wash their hands. I know that sounds silly, but they really don't always don't always take the the smallest, easiest precautions, and that's just stuff you can't mess with. Um, so I put together a binder that's like, you know, in, in, in language that was like, not trying to be insulting, but you need to do this or else I will die. And, you know, um, that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I would put, uh, I put a list of a directory of all of my doctors, their phone numbers, notes on what they handled. I put information from the, um, main disease websites and foundations that, um, that I belong to that, that had like, you know, top 10 facts you should know about this disease so that even doctors who don't want to admit that they don't know anything about it, do a really quick read through in the exam room and be like, Oh yes, I am an expert. I know all about this without feeling embarrassed. (laughs) So, So I made that binder, which actually turned out to be incredibly helpful. I used it with paramedics. I used it with nurses in the emergency room. I even used it with specialists who are not specialists in this particular area. And then I put together a second binder that had my case in it. And that was a thick binder, as you can imagine, um, medical records, really the whole case file. And nobody got to take that out of the room. They could make copies, but that was mine to keep. Um, so I recommend that all patients really get their documentation in hand. But I know that there's an issue with feeling like you can't say something to doctors, like you can't speak up for yourself. And, um, you know, I talk about that in the book, but really you just, you have to get over it. (laughs) Mm. You know, I I know that's, that's not something that patients want to hear. It's an awkward conversation, but you know, um, it's your body. It's the only one you have and you can't play nice with everybody. It's too important for your safety. So yeah, I mean, having your boundaries and making them clear to all the medical professionals you work with is is not something that's just you know a, a minor part of your your design as a patient i mean it's it's potentially a life-saving tool for you yeah i feel like um you know when your safety when your life is at stake niceties go out the window right and <laughs> yeah and i feel like one of the things you talk about in the book is you have to find a doctor that's cool with that. And you know what? If you find if you have a doctor that's not okay with sometimes not being nice to each other because this is a serious thing, then you need to find another doctor. Is that is that mm-hmm. accurate? Yeah, uh, it's really a matter of. There's definitely a checklist that you go through when you go to a new doctor. You do your research before you go in. You know, does this doctor have any medical malpractice against them? You talk to the secretary at the office. Does he know anything about your disease? Even if they say yes, you go in assuming that they know absolutely nothing because secretaries often lie about these things. You <laughs> <laughs> the door. Um, you know, and when you go in there, you need to make sure that doctors are going to understand that this is a two-way street. Not only do you want to be educated, you want to educate. You want to be a part of your treatment plan because in being a part of your own treatment plan, you make your quality of life a priority. And frankly, that's not always the priority for your doctor. The priority is doing what they feel will make you healthiest, which they don't always have the perfect and right answers on that. So you have to be a part of the decision making, you know, and that comes to black box medications, to long term treatments, and you have to figure out how to communicate and say, you know, this is either okay or this is not good enough for my quality of life. Alana, what you talk about in terms of binders, uh, that's a great idea. In fact, I just started carrying a folder of my stuff, like four or five years ago, so I'm a little behind. But how did you, I'm curious how you manage those binders. Were they small enough to fit in your purse or were they always back home somewhere? Like how in the, I'm just trying to picture, I don't, 
I don't know how I would manage two different binders at all times. So how was that a struggle or did you just build it into your routine? The binders go where I go. The hilarious thing is that I was just at my gastroenterologist's office the other day and they were weighing me and my mom stopped me and she was like, weigh your purse. And I was like, what, why? And she's like, she told the nurse, she's like, she carries the heaviest purse I've ever seen anyone carry, and she's exhausted. She needs to weigh her purse to see how much her purse weighs. And my purse weighed nine pounds. And I was like, I don't care. That's my important thing. I need to have those things with me. <laughs> so I'm used to, like, carrying a lot of stuff. But um, for me, that, that big binder, the one that has, like, my whole life story in it, that I generally only took to specialist appointments and like treatment planning appointments with, um, with general doctors. But I took my emergency folder, which had like, how do you handle a, a you know, wash your hands kind of that binder, <laughs> which was smaller. That one wasn't a hardcover. That was just like a, a <laughs> collated folder. Um, that one I took everywhere with me. And I also had note cards that were, I'm such a dork. They were laminated <laughs> note cards held together with like a binder ring or binder clip that I kept in my purse um, if I was just going out for dinner or something um, that had, uh, you know, my, my very basic medical information and also where to find that folder if I didn't have it on me. Um, I had a period uh, last year where I just kept fainting in public. I fainted in Einstein's. I fainted in Publix, um, <laughs> just mm -hmm. like out to get a bagel and grocery shopping. And I would just be on the floor and then the paramedics would be there. And, you know, it's like, oh, crap, how do I explain everything to a paramedic when I <laughs> can barely speak? I don't know where I am. And, you know, so, um, so yeah, I learned to carry notes with me. So there are lots of little like tools and tips that I, that I learned from. And this was all great because I kind of, I went through Pinterest, I went through other blogs, I looked on forums and kind of just saw what other people were doing and, um, adjusted it to fit my specific circumstances. So I think it, it's a little different for everyone. Not everyone is going to need to carry so many materials, but um, it's good to have identifying information. I did a lot of research actually on medical ID bracelets and um, you know different medical identifying um, materials to have with you and what does and doesn't work and actually spoke with different paramedics because there are um, some like ID bracelets out right now that have like USBs in them that you know doctors can access. But it turns out paramedics don't ever use those from the ones mm. that I spoke with. They said that that's not something that they, they're like, no, we stick you in the ambulance. If you have something to read, we'll read it. But we're, we're there for like life-saving support. We don't have a laptop that we're going to whip out and read your whole <laughs> medical history. <so. laughs> that's a good point. So what, yeah. what in your research, what turned out to be the best thing to do as far as like a bracelet or, or some kind of identifying thing? Two two binders that weighed <laughs> well, that weighed nine binders. pounds. <laughs> it was for different situations. Like if you're in the sure. emergency room, sure. you have that folder that has basic procedure. If you're seeing a specialist and you're like ongoing, undiagnosed complex case, you have to have your full binder with you at at all those major appointments. Um, and if you're fainting or having episodes in public that you can't control, if you have epilepsy or things like that, if you you know, any kind of situation where you have um, any, you know, any kind of situation where you're independent and alone, uh, which is also something I, I go over in great detail in the book about how to, like, be independent with an unpredictable disease. Um, the note cards were, were the biggest hit. They, they were the thing that I personally found to be most effective um, and that I had read from other people was, was the most effective thing. You know, just out of curiosity, I've got a a question for Kyle. Kyle, be honest here. How heavy is your purse? <laughs> Dude, I pared it down. It's uh, <laughs> it fits in my front pocket now. Oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> nice. So Alana, I kinda shifting gears again. Um 
you talk about, and, and even the title of the episode is Living Life with the Invisible Conditions. What, what was the general response from those who, in your world, that thought you looked just fine and maybe you were just trying to get some attention, so to speak? Well, there are a combination of, I guess, confusion and pity and aggressive and unrealistic, like, hopefulness. You know, we all deal with that, but you don't look sick response. And, um, you know, I think that that uh, all reactions that I had to, to telling someone about my disease when it just wasn't obvious in my appearance were more of, you know, it, it was more of, I don't want this to be the case for you. Couldn't we make it so that this isn't the case for you? I don't think people say, you know, people who say, but you don't look sick come from a malicious place. And this is so easy to like misidentify when you're chronically ill and you've survived, you've survived years of defiance from doctors who didn't want to diagnose you or look into your case. You become defensive and you kind of live under the impression that anyone who doesn't immediately, you know, concede that you have a disease is trying to say you're a liar, you're a fake. But we have to change our thought process. We have to look at the reasons that people say, but you don't look sick. You know, they say it because they don't understand what this disease looks like. They say it because they don't understand what kind of reaction they're supposed to have. They say it because they don't want to make you feel, you know, they, they want to make you feel better about your situation. Um, the first time someone argued with me about, about using a handicap spot, I remember just getting back in my car in tears and just feeling this, this awful, shameful, horrible hatred like for them and for myself. And I sat down with my mom at her kitchen table and she said to me, you know, you can't expect everyone to understand your situation the second they encounter it, the second they see it. Like, you have to be the educator. You have to take on that responsibility. And you can't do it with rage because rage makes you feel helpless. So, um, again, with the tools, like, I created these business cards that explained why I parked handicapped and what my disease was. And it gave them a link where they could, you know, learn more if they wanted to learn more, which not everyone will want to learn more. But, you know, I have to walk away from that situation knowing that I did my best to educate someone. You know, that's the most empowering thing I can do. Everything else is just, it's up to them. I love that. I, uh, you know, one of the things I've been challenging myself to work on is to respond with more grace in all of my responses, whether it's somebody cuts me off in traffic or somebody at work says something rude. And it also happens to be true for me when somebody looks at me funny because I parked in a handicap spot or they pull me out of line because they think I'm drunk, which is very, uh, it's just common symptom for the condition I live with. And just recently, I realized that I, man, sometimes I get really short tempered when somebody looks at me funny and says, You can't park there or you can't sit there. And I'm like, BS, yes, I can. They get on my face. <laughs> and I'm like, You know, that's, that's an unfair response because they don't know. It's not like they're trying to be mean or rude. They're trying to protect what they think they know. Um, so I'm glad you say that. And that's, that's something I'm working on personally, too. <laughs> It's something everyone works on. I think that, like, the the most natural reaction to having, like, an invisible disability or, you know, and, and when I say invisible disability, I want to, like, clarify that, too, because an invisible disability is not, like, you don't have, I, I mean, it could be, like, you're in a wheelchair, but you're sitting down and they don't see the wheelchair. Like, <laughs> you know, an invisible disability qualifies so much more than just, you know, very obvious, but... Um, everyone really struggles with that. I mean, like I said, that first situation for me, I, I mean, I did not say some nice things. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I'm slowly learning to have a better attitude about it, but it's, it's, it's definitely not a natural thing to like immediately have patience and understanding for people who are arguing with a fact of life that is so freaking difficult for you to deal with every moment of every day and for them to be like, oh, you're not dealing with anything. 
it's just like, you have no idea about my life. You don't mm. know me. Yeah. But yeah. then, you know, when we, when we, cause I have that same thing too. I've had that in several situations. Um, but then we realize at some point, right, that we have control over how we react to those. And that affects totally. how people th think of us and treat us in that situation. Um, and I think that's part of what both of you are saying. Mm -hmm. Alana, in your book and in your writing and just in your disposition, um, you approach all these terrible situations with a lot of humor and how do you get to that point in dealing with your condition where you can approach it with humor because i don't think that's a immediate thing yeah no um i think the trick is practice <laughs> like i said i blog i blogged about really everything everything the good and bad that was happening for so many years with my chronic disease and when i would sit down to write a post i would think about not about all the bad things that had happened necessarily but if i looked at it as a whole you know there was one situation where i was i was writing this post about the day before Thanksgiving and my family is kosher and I am not, but I went to a, like a discount grocery store and I was trying to find this kosher pie dough and I had a kidney infection and I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to faint in the store. It's going to be a big deal. I don't like, nobody knows me here. And I was like, but I have to find the pie. I'm not leaving the store without the pie. <laughs> and <laughs> and like I was miserable I walked out of there without the pie but I mean it was just such a a moment of like defiance against the disease and it's like that's how I'm going to shape this post not in my misery about you know how I felt but in like you know I'm going to get what I need and when I think about it, it it's all just a lot funnier and if I put it myself in a different context but you know, and I wanted to do that with the book as well. I like to think I'm a funny person, and, and that's why I wanted to shine in this story. I didn't want people to look at this book and think, great, here's another depressing story about life with disease. You know, this is not a depressing story. It's a hopeful one. It's a funny one. I wanted people to be able to look at these situations and laugh. Yeah, I love it. And I think it widens the audience a lot to your subject because people can go into it confident knowing they're not just going to get some sob story that they're going to get depressed over but they're going to learn some information and maybe like laugh and connect with somebody through their writing like holy cow that's pretty cool i hope so you know we don't want to give the whole book away because, um, of course, we'd love for people to go out and read it. But there's one more thing I know you talk about in your book that I'd love to talk about here. And that's dealing with or facing sex, dating, marriage, that whole relationship aspect while living with a chronic disease or illness. Tell us a little bit about where you your background there or kind of how you approach that topic either for yourself or for some other people that might uh, seek you out. Sure. Yeah. So that was really something I wanted to cover in the book. Um, now I personally, I, um, I was sick before I met my then boyfriend, now husband. Um, and I think I, I kept my disease secret for him, from him successfully for about three days and after that, it was a complete deluge of just, like, this is everything that's happening. This is a mess. I'm a mess. Welcome to the mess. And, um, you know, he was a trooper and has been a trooper our whole relationship and marriage. And I don't know. If he, I didn't know if he was just one of those really unique people who can, like, just take things in stride. And so I really set out to find that out. Like, how do people date? with chronic illnesses, with disabilities, with, you know, uh, medical devices, with tubes, ports, ostomies, you know, all of these things mm -hmm. that are, you know, deeply personal, but like, once you get to an intimate relationship, hello, they're like, they're front and center. So, um, 
so I did interviews with a lot of uh, a lot of different patients. We talked about like putting together a Tinder profile, what you would put in it, like whether or not, like when, at what point in the relationship do you make the big reveal? Is that something that happens mm. before the first date, after the third date, once you get into bed <laughs> together? Um, and it, it led to a lot of funny stories and a lot of um, a lot of really interesting insights. But I think overall, we give a really good. Um, overall look at, you know, advice, not just from patients, but also from psychologists and relationship experts, even sex therapists chimed in in the book. So we have a lot of really good resources for people who are single, dating, in long-term relationships, um, and married. So I think all the way through, we really, we really did manage to cover it. I'm excited about it. You know, I haven't, to be completely fair and honest, um, we got the book just not too long ago, and I haven't been able to read all of it, and when I realized I was running out of time, I kind of jumped around a bit, um, so I haven't read any sections on uh, dating, marriage, and the sex life, so I am curious, can you answer that one question? When it comes to revealing your your stuff, um What's the most common advice up front after the third date? What what's common? People were saying up front, especially if you're doing online dating, um, they thought that the best way to reveal that you had a disease or a condition was before the first date. Mm. That was the most successful for most people. It's probably a good way to weed out the people that are going to be a waste of time if they're not willing right? to. Right. Why? Why put yourself through it if they're not even going to be <laughs> Exactly. Like, don't waste yep. your time. Don't waste yeah. their time. So, Alana, so much information and uh, our listener, anybody can find so much more in your book. I'm super excited to keep talking about that. And, of course, we'll talk about where to find it toward the end and we'll have links to it in our show notes. But, Alana, what else is going on in your life? You talked earlier about being a professional advocate. So first of all, can you tell us what that means and then tell us um, about some of the other things that you are working on? Sure. So a professional patient advocate, that role has is, is really evolved a lot in the last decade or so. Um, it used to be that patient advocates were kind of just people assigned to you in the hospital to help you figure out your case. But now patient advocates work all over the place. Um, in for-profit companies and non-profit companies, overall just in education. Um, so for me, I, I definitely wear a lot of hats uh, and I have a couple of, of projects. Um, I became a patient advocate around the same time that my mom actually became a patient advocate. She is a TV producer. She produces uh, the show, The Balancing Act on Lifetime TV, which is their daily morning talk show. And after I was diagnosed, she decided that she was going to throw pretty much all of her time and efforts into creating a second show called Behind the Mystery, Rare and Genetic, which is a really cool educational series that does segments on rare diseases, different research, pharmaceutical companies, different treatments that are coming out. So that's a really cool um, project. I've been on the show a few times. Um, so that's on Lifetime TV every uh, weekday morning, if you guys want to check that out. And then um, one of the other things that I'm involved in, I work as the manager of patient advocacy for FDNA and the Genomics Collaborative, which is a project that is being launched on World War Disease Day this year. Um, FDNA is the makers behind Face to Gene which is a software that geneticists and healthcare providers can use to help them analyze facial features in connection with genetic diseases. We are starting this collaborative to involve patients, advocacy groups, researchers, doctors, labs, life science companies, public health officials, really everyone, in using this technology to make discoveries about diseases and disease biomarkers things like facial analysis that we've done in the past, but in the future, we're also looking to use other things like medical imaging and test results on a large scale. So basically what we're doing is opening up online patient portals and asking patients to submit information about their cases, uh, facial photos, um, 
things like that. This is all secure. We de-identify uh, all photos, and it's all used basically to crowdsource knowledge to help doctors learn more about different um, diseases, particularly rare diseases, get familiar with them, and, and hopefully um, with crowdsourcing all this patient information, we'll be able to make some discoveries and create overall disease models that will help doctors know more about the disease when you say its name. So that sounds absolutely amazing. And it launched on Rare Disease Day. And um, so is this something that people can get involved in online or? Yeah, they can. They can go to genomicscollaborative.com and they can explore, reach out, and you know, together we can we can work on making some scientific breakthroughs. Nice. Beautiful. That's awesome. Yeah. Of course, we'll have the links in our show notes as well. Tell us a little bit about your social media. I know that um, I've been following you now for a month or so, and and you're pretty active. So where do people find you, and what kind of stuff can they expect? Um, well, you can find me on Instagram. I'm super active on Instagram, just at Alana, I-L-A-N-A underscore Jacqueline, J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E. And I'm also on, um, on Facebook at facebook.com slash let's feel better which is my blog um and twitter at alana jacklin awesome do you still keep up with your blog i do yes and i'm going to be doing a lot more stuff on it now that the book is out um so the other exciting project i'm working on is as a board member of ida which is the invisible disability association they have a new campaign called Invisible No More, where they're asking patients to submit videos of their invisible illness stories and ask their friends and families to vote for it. The videos with the most votes win prizes. Our top prize is a trip to our annual conference in Colorado, which includes airfare, hotel stay, as well as a $500 gift card. Oh, and a copy of my book. Yeah. Oh, that, that's awesome. As we start to wrap up here, how can people find your book and, and purchase it and check it out for themselves? Well, the book, again, is called Surviving and Thriving with an Invisible Chronic Illness. It's available on Amazon, on uh, Barnes & Nobles. It'll be in bookstores everywhere on March 1st. And um, you can find out more places to buy it, more places where I might be doing readings or signings at its main website, which is chronicillnesssurvivor.com. Very exciting. I love it. I look forward to uh, tracking you down at some point or crossing paths with you and getting my early edition signed. I hope so. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Alana. This has been a, a fun conversation. I really enjoy hearing about all that you're doing. And oh, you know what? Actually, one more question before we let you off the hook here. Uh, you mentioned a long time ago that you're, I think you said 28. Yeah. What do you What do you want to do? Or where do you want to be in 10 or 20 years? What, do, what are some of the things that are, are exciting dreams for you? Um, oh, wow, 10, 10 years, hopefully I'll be on maybe like book number five. Oh, and wow. <laughs> I mean, then hopefully just continuing to find more effective ways to advocate for people with chronic illnesses and maybe a second tool. I mean, I, I just, I dream big guys. Yeah. Nice. Well, I love it. Maybe some sitting around on the couch on the weekend and stuff like that. <laughs> <We'll be doing laughs> some it some laundry on some days. <laughs> I'm going to take a real long nap. That's just I, that's a big dream. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, for talking about your life and your book and all the different things you have going on. Uh, hopefully our listeners have enjoyed you and your perspective. Be sure to check out Alana's book at, I already forgot, chronicillnesssurvivor.com. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. 
find us online at two disabledudes.com and please subscribe and review on Apple Podcasts. We'd like to hear from you. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Special thanks to our audio producer, Jake Tompkins, who also composed the music. Until next time, keep living with urgency.